Today we're going to dive into the Boss 429, the most misunderstood Ford engine of all time. So stay tuned, but in order to do this, we've got to go back to 1964 for some NASCAR history. Mopar had been competing with the 426 wedge to no avail against the Ford 427, so Chrysler set out to put Hemi-style cylinder heads on the raised block 426 to create the 426 Hemi. Behind the pace car, gold feather number 26 Plymouth and petty number 43 Plymouth, first row. Junior Johnson number 3 Dodge and Pardue number 54 Plymouth, second row. The white flag. One more lap to go, and Richard Petty is still moving along easy and strong. Richard had one lap lead over second, two laps over third and fourth. The crowd cheered that Richard Petty and his number 43 Plymouth Hates the checkered flag going away. Richard Petty rolls into the winner's circle as his father did five years ago. The jubilant Petty crew runs to greet him. This is their victory, too. They who have worked so long and so hard for the big one. This has been a great show for Plymouth, who ran one, two, three. Ardu was second, and Goldsmith third. Ford didn't take this lightly. They knew that if you won on Sunday, you sold cars on Monday. So that led to the development of the 90-day wonder, the 427 SOHC, a great engine producing 616 horsepower at 7,000 revolutions per minute with a single four-barrel carburetor and 657 horsepower at 7,500 revolutions per minute with dual four-barrel carburetors. But Bill France of NASCAR realized what was coming down the pipe, and he decided to ban these new exotic engines for 1965, which left the Hemi and the 427 SOHC without a place to race. We adopted the rules because we wanted to bring the cost of racing down, and also we hoped that it would increase the availability of high-performance engines, which I believe it's going to. The 1965 racing season was pretty much a runaway season for Ford and Mercury, as Chrysler was out of the picture, and they focused their efforts on drag racing. So Ford went back to the 427 FE engine and did really well with it. In fact, they stayed with that power plant all the way up until 1969 in different configurations, but it set things in motion for what was to come. By the late 1960s, it was apparent Ford was going to need a new engine to remain competitive against the Hemi in the aero wars of NASCAR. Bunky Nudis, who had just come over in 1968 from GM, gave the mandate to build an engine that could go dominate NASCAR, which led to the Boss 429. But in order to be legal for competition, they had to install that engine into 500 cars, which led to the Boss 429 Mustang. The problem was, they didn't get it installed into the cars soon enough, so they went halfway through the 1969 season running the 427 tunnel port. When you want to be the best, you go get the best, and that's exactly what Ford did in 1969. They went and lured Richard Petty away from the Chrysler camp, and for the first time, Petty Blue was now Ford Blue. Here Petty drove his 69 Ford in a six-lap victory over a starting field of 32 at speeds topping 130 miles an hour. This led to an all-star cast in 1969. You had Richard Petty. Rich, how do you like your new fireproof suit? Thing worked pretty good. I guess it's the uh, biggest difference is a different color. I think we got some comments on that, but uh, I cool sort of watered myself down before the race started and and got it good and wet, and it worked real good. It's uh, worked just like a cool suit, so it worked real good. Cale Yarborough, David Pearson, Donnie Allison, and Leroy Yarborough. This led to total dominance in 1969. One of the small details that gets left out about the Boss 9 is the fact that Ford contracted Holly carburetors to develop a specialty carburetor just for that engine. Hence, the Dominator was born, and in fact, it powered them to their first win in Atlanta with Cale Yarborough, which you're about to see. Around the final turn and down the home stretch. 
You would think, with all of the success that came from the NASCAR super speedways, that that would transfer over to the street, but it didn't happen that way. The Boss Mustangs could barely get into the 13-second range in the quarter mile, and there's a lot that causes this. But it also leads to another issue. Many other professional drag racers tried to use this engine, and they didn't have much luck either. And so, that's where the story is going to go from here. You're going to find out what made it great and what did. I want to give a huge shout-out to Sam Oxier Jr., drag racing legend. He took time to talk with me about the shortcomings of the Boss 9 in both the street application and in drag racing. You see, he drag raced everything from 427 tunnel ports to 427 SOHCs and the Boss 9. With his experience, he was able to tell me why he thought it failed. The Ford engineers tried their best to tame this NASCAR race engine well enough to be able to put into the Mustang. They put a 735 CFM Holly on it with a hydraulic cam and small other changes, but people complained about this as the engine was sluggish in performance and was actually slower than the Cobra jet cars. The first engine was designated as the S-Code. Then the engineers came out with a mechanical cam and made changes to the rotating assembly to try to lighten it up, and that engine is called the T-Code. You would think with those massive Hemi heads that that would be one of its strongest attributes, when in fact on the street and on the drag strip, it proved to be one of its biggest hindrances. The ports were too large to be able to fill the cylinders with the air charge needed to make good torque. When discussing with Sam about the boss, he informed me about the company politics that were involved in it. You see, Ford was no longer manufacturing the camera. They wanted everyone to go to the latest and greatest, the Boss 9. And what always looks good on paper doesn't mean that it will equal gains at the track. And that's the prime case for this engine. The engine didn't respond to typical modifications like you would think. The rotating assembly was entirely too heavy. It didn't respond to induction changes or cam changes, and that's because the cylinder heads were designed to run wide open on super speedways. Many racers just gave up and went back to the camera because they knew that it worked. It wasn't for a few years that racers figured out how to make this engine run. Ohio George Montgomery had huge success with the camera in the Mr. Gasket Gasser with the 427 camera with the 671 supercharger. He won the 1969 Nationals at Indy. But when he was forced to run the Boss 9, he decided to go a completely different route. Twin turbos. In fact, it was so impressive that NHRA actually outlawed him in 1975 because he won the 73 and 74 Gator Nationals with the Boss 9 turbocharged. Boss development in the mid-1970s kind of took a back seat. This is for the reason of NHRA Pro Stock highly favoring small block combinations in small chassis and NASCAR going from the big blocks to the small blocks in 1975. This created no home for the Boss engine, and all of that changed up in 1982 when NHRA mandated a 500 cubic inch rule, and that brought the Boss 9 back out into the limelight, and it was going to be better than ever. The Boss made its comeback in 1981 when none other than Ronnie Sox, driving the Ford Mustang in IHRA Pro Stock, won the championship. So that was the first championship that was won with the Boss 9. Going into the 1982 season, Bob Glidden was building a Ford EXP car. It was originally meant to run the 351 Cleveland-based engine, but when the rules changes came out, he found out that he was going to have to build a 500 cubic inch engine from scratch and put it in this car, which created all kinds of handling problems. Having 500 cubic inches underneath these cylinder heads made a huge difference. And with Bob and Edna Glidden's tuning, they took this thing to the next level. When the T-Bird chassis came out, they won every championship from 1985 until 1989. Starting line, the Pro Stock's ready to go. This man has been having lots of problems all season long. Bob Glidden is beginning, though, to get his Ford EXP sorted out. If that's not something to be proud of, I don't know what is. While the Boss 9 may have had a misunderstanding in its history, it is also arguably one of the best-looking engines of all time, and history has been really kind to this engine. And is it now a Ford legend? Let us know in the comments below. We really appreciate your support. Thank you for watching.